Yeah, we're, we're, uh, there we go. We're back. Episode number three, Thomas Turgoose. Back again, number three. Number three of a series. Great guest. Yeah, really good guest. Um, Johnny Harris. Yeah. Really good subject as well. Um, I think we've, I think we've nearly known Johnny. I nearly know Johnny for half my life. I think. I've nearly known him for as long as I've been alive, and I haven't. Yeah, that's that's strange. So yeah, because we met him on This Is England '86, right? He plays Mick. Oh no, I'm I'm years out. I'm absolutely years out. What do you mean? I need another eight years of knowing him. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> but that's good. That's bad maths. That. <laughs> That quick is bad maths. maths, not quick maths, bad maths. Um, <laughs> we've known no, him sorry. 12 years, we've known him probably about 12 years. Yeah, something like that, yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, as, as Johnny touches base in the, um, in, the, uh, in the episode, it was, um, he's so magnetic to watch, isn't he? And when, mm-hmm. he, when he touched base, when he came into the rehearsal rooms with us all and how nervous he was about being with us all, but then yeah. quickly sort of adapted into the way that we all are on set. Yeah, because um, I wanted to be an outsider looking in on that group. No, especially because of how mental we all are when that's we're there. What I mean, yeah, that's what I mean. Like, yeah, because when you start jobs, like, you know, when you, when you do jobs and you go on as like a guest lead or, or something, you know, you'll know yourself, like, it's hard to kind of get in, not get in with a group, but it's kind of one of them. You're the outsider, aren't you? So, yeah. And you feel like you want to be involved in everything that's going on, and you can't be. Yeah. <laughs> to a certain extent, but uh, it's like being a new kid at a school, isn't it? You know, if you moved to secondary school. Yeah. And, you, and then when you went to a, and there's a big group of people, and you're just like, oh, I just want to be mates with them. Um, big, big school full of uh, absolute drunks and idiots like we were back in the day. Yeah, back in the day. <laughs> um, no, but again, I know we say it all the time, but it was, it's you know, it's up there with one of my favourite episodes, and he's so. Um, mm. Is is very much like a bit like Shane Meadows or uh, Joe Gilgan. Whenever he starts talking, it's like you can. This will probably be the quietest episode I think from me and you. Yeah, I think we listen most. And 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 like I say, he's a great storyteller. And also didn't know, but what a good impressionist! Like you guys are in for a treat if you watch yeah. or if you're listening. Like if if you literally will watch Johnny Harris turn into Shane Meadows about four times in this. Interview. Yeah, yeah, it's great. He's, right. um, but he's he's super talented and he's he's one of yeah. the most intense people I've been on um, around yeah. the set. He can be, you know, like you said before, he likes to be separated from people and um, and sort of. But I, I mean, I guess with, with the character that he did play in this is in the eighty six and ninety and eighty eight. Uh, was it? He was in eighty six and eighty eight, wasn't he? Um, yeah. The flashbacks no. and things. Yeah. Um, but he's so like because of the character that he's playing, he 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 really needed to take himself aside and really get into it because he's such an awful character to play so um he's very intense he gets the results mm. he looks amazing and he is amazing but also one of the most lovely down-to-earth gentlemen i've ever met i was just going to say that like on the flip side of that obviously when he's not working he is like genuinely one of the nicest blokes mm. and, it, and it, it does pay off because like my missus um she was she was quite nervous meeting him i always say this to him like when when we kind of first got together, me and my missus, and it was uh, we had a This Is England party or something, and she was a bit scared about meeting mm. Johnny. Like, what? Yeah. No, Johnny's lovely. She's like, no, he's he's a scary man, and I'm like, oh no, he plays a scary man. Yeah, he can he can be scary because he was a he was a great boxer, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was like regional champion or or, or GB champion or something when he was younger. I'm, I think um, I remember my dad saying something about it. He'd had a good good chat with him about it. Um, yeah, man, not to be messed with, and so g- not just this is England. I mean, Jawbone is one of my one of my favourite films. Um, yeah. I was right. blown away by it. I think he was unbelievable in that. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you hear my washer? It's dead loud. Can you hear it? No, I can't hear your washer. Yeah, that's good then. I'm sorry if anyone listening can, can hear my washer. It's dead loud. Was me, I did. Um, <laughs> yeah, Johnny's subject obviously is fear. And we, I guess, like me and you, fear. We, we fear. Yeah, you say fear. it weird, don't you? Fear. I say fear. Fear, mate. Fear, mate. Um, You're Johnny, right, fuck off. <laughs> Johnny's subject is fear, and um, we wanted to put this one out. We were probably going to put this out a bit later, weren't we, at first? But then we decided, mm. you know, we've had what three 
nearly four weeks of isolation now. We just got told we might have a few more, and we will have a few more. Sorry, and 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 you know, people are kind of worried and scared, and 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 talking to Johnny in this kind of put my mind at rest a lot, and mm. you, you know, not being, you know, scared of of, of stuff that you see on social media and things like that, you know, and, and, and just be mindful of it, I guess. Yeah, he's a very positive man, Johnny. Mm. In every in any in any aspect, he's he's very, really negative and I don't think I've ever heard him say a bad word about anyone ever. No. Um so I was kind of for us it was like it was like a therapy session I thought for for, yeah. for me. It was very reassuring, um and very switched on and yeah, he's sort of like he opens your mind up into different ways that you never thought possible, yeah. and he can, he can really change the, the your thought process on a lot of things and the way that you look at things. Definitely, definitely. So that's that's why we want to get into it this week, I guess. Um, <laughs> that's you, Thomas Tiggers. Mm. Um, I was going to say something a minute ago. Oh yeah, um, let's uh, get into the interview anyway. Yeah. Um, just yeah. a little bit of backstory on uh, what, what we're talking about. We, wherever we ring our guests on Skype, we always have a little chat beforehand, don't we? Just catch up, how are you doing and all that. Um, while recording this one, um, I come in at, we come in at a weird point because I pressed record because we were having such a great chat about, um, about Frey Bentos Pies. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, when you listen, uh, that's what we're talking about at the top of the interview. Um, Frey, Frey Bentos Pies. So, should we just stick it on? Yeah, let's bang it on, mate. Enjoy, see go. you after. You know, because he I'm said just, hey, we can do it early, and I said, I said oh, I've just put a pie in the oven. It'll be about twenty minutes. And most people would come back and sort of say, "Oh, okay, mate, not a worry." And then we'll get on with the show. Tom, I did, and he just come back and went, "What pie? <laughs> yeah, what pie is it?" <laughs> just so you know, we're, we're recording now, Johnny. Well, when we're oh, yeah, I've just started recording on the topic of pies. The um, pie chat was brilliant, so I thought yeah. I'll, get, I'll, I'll I'll try and get some of it in I've there. Got, <laughs> I've got um, calls coming through on Skype. I don't know how I stop those. Oh, no. just leave. Oh, I haven't got. A play. And Can you hear them? Yes. And they're pinging. You're not no, hearing them. Not no. hearing anything, mate. Yeah. We're all good. Have you got the yeah. background there, have you? Have you got the old... Um... Yeah, you can do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you just go to the bottom right, you see them little three dots on your screen. Yeah, good thing to do, is it? Yeah. yeah you just, it just focuses on your pretty face, doesn't it, instead of your pretty flowers? <laughs> all right, let's do it, man. Let's um, let's get Welcome that. to Overrated There everybody. you go. It's Johnny Harris, how to do Skype. <laughs> with my sexy blurred background man i love it yeah um so w- for anyone who's listening we've just um we started the skype chat and johnny was telling us about his lunch um about a pie in a tin which i strongly disagree with what was it <laughs> i can't believe it man i'm disappointed tom frey bennett's pie i thought it frey came Bennett's from the north i thought it was london's gift from the north mate i um it was my childhood it, that was my childhood uh like at least once a week, we'd have Frey Bentos pie and chips, or Chef's Hat, my uncle called it, and chips. Uh, what was a childhood meal? I learned, I say learned how to cook. My, I, um, I used to uh, boil some pasta, um, and then I used to just put a can of chicken soup into the pasta. And you <laughs> see that. That's what I used to eat a lot when I was a kid. I remember that. Ah, right. Yeah, that's, that's, why got, that's why I've got a six pack. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's why I'm absolutely shredded, because I was just on carbs from... The age of five, clean <laughs> carbs. Uh, mine was um, a piece of bread, and you know the the square cheese that isn't really cheese, like the thin kind of Plastic. slice of cheese. Yeah. I used to put that on and put it in the microwave for like thirty seconds. Yeah, man. Well, it was like you know, made uh, last week. I made my first ever stew, uh, like my first proper stew. Could well, you cook quite a lot? Uh, actually, there? I made I made one um, once before. No, I don't cook a lot. I tell you what it is, Tom. I right? the once in a, a five year when I do cook. I'll put it on Instagram, so it looks like I cook a lot, you know? Like, I cook a lot. It's once in a blue moon. But, to, to be honest, mate, this period now, this isolation, I've cooked more than I've ever cooked. It's so, right. I'm yeah, I've got one of those um, slow cooker things. I've just never used it. And then, so the other week, I got it out and, um, and done a stew. And then, and, and then um, 
And then last week, sorry, I'd done my second one. I'd, I'd done another one and it was, oh man, it was great. You know, but, but it's horrible in isolation because I'm on my own, you know, and um, and I was looking around oh. for a round of applause, you know. I got this <laughs> And you know, when you're a bloke and you cook Send something. Send some up to me, mate, and I'll give you one. <laughs> well, 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 as long as it stops you from having pie out of the sin. <laughs> How are you? Sick, and how's it all going? How's your, the podcast? And I've, I've been listening in a couple of times. It's great. Yeah, it's great, it's isn't good. it? We're, Loving it. Yeah, we enjoy, we enjoy doing it. And it's, um, I mean, obviously, it's a bit different now because we're, we're having to do it on the on the old Skype. But um, we enjoy it, don't we? It's, it's, an, it's a chance for us to get together. And um, you know, meet friends or meet new people, new guests, and that. And um, yeah, it's good. It's good. It's just uh, we both got jobs at the end of the last year, so we stopped doing it. And then it, every time we go to do it again, one of us gets a job, which is great. But yeah. obviously, we want to keep the podcast going as well. So yeah, it's, uh, it's yeah, one it's of tough, them. But it's a great excuse to sort of like get people like yourself on, who obviously we've known for a long time. But I guess when we was when we was kids, um, you was just sort of like looking after me and Andy Ellis when we used to come into work still drunk all the time whilst he was there being professional <laughs> me and Andy had come into work obviously when we was doing 86 but it's nice to like, like you uh, were outrageous man all of you it was the most beautiful experience wasn't it oh really it was yeah what was it, what was it like coming for, for you obviously because we'd already done the film oh, and then you came man, into the it series. was surreal it was surreal so so like the film came out um at the same time as London to Brighton a film I'd done Great films, yeah. All at the same festivals that year. Do you remember, like, and, like, the Biffa Awards and stuff? That was the first time I'd ever met Shane. And I was still drinking back then, so I don't remember it much. But I remember I remember vividly, I think it was around the time I gave up drink, right? And I, and I so I was sober, and I went to the cinema with my ex, and we saw This Is England, the film. Because I'd been meeting you all at these festivals uh, and stuff. Like, I've met you all at um, the awards and stuff. And it was just like a great bunch and we'd sort of party together a bit. And then I went and watched it and it blew me apart. You know, like it, it was, I'll, I'll never forget it. Like, it, oh. and it's, it's a strange thing to say, like, it, but it, you know, because of what happened afterwards, like, it sounds like I might be biased, like, but, but I said it long before and I said it publicly at the time as well. That's one, that film will always be in my top five films. Like oh. it, it's yeah. almost, it's almost easy to underestimate it because it's so, um, you feel like they're your pals on the screen, you know, yeah. a, for when you're watching like a raging bull or something like that. It's so kind of endemic. It's so in you, that film, that it's easy to just pass it off as being with your pals or something. It's yeah. an astonishing piece of art. It's an but incredible piece of work. I guess, I, I guess it, it really comes across on the screen because, well, you, you've seen it and you're part of it now. You know, we are all, we're all a family. And that's exactly how it is. And you know, when they say when they when Shane says cut on set, we don't we don't just stop being no. them people. Like that's who we are. You know, you know what I mean? We first um, apparently I was one of the first people Shane ever let have a dressing room, right? And and this is the reason, right? Is um so so you know I, I had this amazing experience seeing the film, blew me away, and just remember thinking something's happening here in British cinema, something's going on, and like and, and you know and it felt like and it felt like a working class thing. It was just electric, man. It was beautiful, and and I felt like you know I, I was hungry and wanted to be part of it all. And but to actually then become part of the, this is England thing, I think it was like four years later, and it mm. wasn't really happening for what me. London Brighton had come and gone, and you know what it's like, guys. Like I weren't really getting auditions for anything other than kind of like you know two lines here and there. You know, like like I, I weren't doing the kind of work I wanted to get. You know, and I was mm, working, yeah. and, I, and I'm not saying it for dramatic purpose like i was close to giving up really close and um i think we've and, all been there haven't we we've all been there like. yeah i've never heard an actor that's not you know and um and i was real close to it and i was working in the union theater caf for my mate ian and the phone call came through it's an outdoor caf it was freezing i remember it i had these glove things on and i answered the phone and they said um shane meadows is going to follow up this is england with a tv series um and he wants you to go up and audition for it um and, and he'd, he'd left a message saying that he thought I was too young. Like he kindly said, look, mate, I think you might be too young, but I love what you did in London to Brighton. And, uh, you know, if you want to come up, it'd be lovely to meet you. And, and so um, that took a bit of pressure off me in a way. And I just went up and met him and then got the part. You know, I remember he mm. rang before I'd left. Like I was on, I was running for the train in um, uh, Nottingham. Um, it was at the Broadway cinema where he auditioned me. And I met Vicky for the first mm. time. And then I was running for the train after it was raining. And um and I had to catch that train. I was skint. My mate Ian, who ran the calf, lent me the money to get up there. 
and if I missed that train, I was stuck. I would have had to jib the train or something. And I, and um, and the phone went. And you know when you're like, oh, not now, you know. But I saw it was like a weird number. And you know when you just get a funny feeling. And I answered it, and it was Shane. And he went, oh, hi, your buddy. He went, um, listen, buddy. He went, uh, you know, look, I know it's a long journey back, and you know, and uh, look, I just wondered if it might make your journey a little bit easier to say I'd love you to do the part, you know, if you'd like to do it. And I was like, yay! Just, oh. like, I remember, I'll never forget that train journey home because I was oh. in a tough people in life at that time. But you know, when you just get this feeling that everything's going to be all right, and I don't mean that. Oh, in, man. I, I can't explain why I felt that. It wasn't like it was you know, a, a huge financial sum or anything like that. I just knew on some level spiritually that life was going to be okay. It was working out and, so, and it was weird. And so then to come up and meet you, right, yeah. uh, came up to rehearse. So this is how I got the dressing room, right? I, I came up to um, rehearse and met you all. Remember we had that party and everything and we started yeah, yeah. rehearsals. And then I went back to London um, after rehearsals and I think it was a couple of weeks and then filming was going to start. And my agent rung to go through the details of the, the deal. And she said, right, you're going to get paid this much. You're going to be staying here. You're going to be doing this. You're going to be doing that. She said, and by the way, with Shane Meadows, no one has dressing rooms or trailers. Like, you know, everyone just all stays together and hangs out on set and everything. And yeah. I said, okay. Now, bearing in mind, I was terrified of losing the job, right? But I thought about it and I thought, and I said to my agent, I said, listen, you know what? I've met that gang, you know? And they're like nothing you've ever met, right? Joe Gilgan, Tom, <laughs> Andy, like all of you, right? And I said, listen, if I'm hanging around with those guys on set, there is no, I, I, de I defy anyone not to laugh and have like the best time of their life, you know? Yeah. yeah. The guy I'm playing, I'm in a different place. Like I can't, like I'm just going to have, it's going to be too good a time, you know? And I've got to tap into something quite dark. And anyway, she went back to Shane and I said, but don't like, be careful how you tell him, you know, because I don't want him to think who's this <laughs> freak Donna, you know, it's a dressing room. Anyway, apparently Mark Herbert went up to Shane and went, oh, Johnny Harris wants a dressing room. And Shane went, what? And he went and he explained it to him. And then Shane went, yeah, I can't argue with that. <laughs> and he gave me well, a fair yeah, yeah, point, you know, yeah. Set. It was only a broom cupboard. I used to sit in there with my headphones. Yeah, <laughs> and hide that fight, you know, and um, so I was kind of terrified of you all because you was all um, uh, you were beautiful. Well, I guess it's kind of like, particularly for obviously your character in in '86, it was like nothing else that any of us had ever experienced on on a on a, a Shane Meadows set really, and it was kind of like for for what you was doing with that character because we never we never had any scenes together or anything, did we? I don't no, think we did. No, no. no. But I, I, one scene, um, a tiny one, I think, um. You get in the back of the car, but it was a lot. Of, it was a couple of, of seconds, weren't it? A yeah, of, yeah, yeah, very, yeah. But yeah. Uh, but I remember sort of seeing you around set and seeing you know to, to the, the place that you was going, and it was kind of like I never knew what it was going to be like. But then when I watched '86 and saw what you did with that, it was like fucking hell. How can the man who's the genuinely one of, and I'm not just saying this because you're because you're here now, but I say it to everyone who I know that you are one of the most ge gentle humbling lovely men I, i've ever met I, when i try <laughs> to explain to people second. how nice you actually are they're like i can't i don't i can't believe it i can't believe it so no, no, it just goes to show what, what a great job you did with that because people you know people sort of can't let go of what you did with that so it, it really 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 it was fucking oh, bless you mate bless you mate bless it's weird for me because i don't look the truth of it is i'd love to sit here and give them um, like some method or something like attach what i do to some method you know but i don't you know i don't know about you guys but I'm a magpie, man. I'll take it from anywhere, you know. I'll take a bit of this, a bit of that. Yeah. I'm just trying to find the truth in some way. And some sometimes I, I fail and I look a bit silly doing that on set or whatever, you know. But you've got to be willing to go there. So I don't even know what it is I do really. So it's funny for yeah. me to hear it from your guys' perspective, you know, because I'm just kind of, you know, rattling around trying to trying to work it out. But um, yeah, you kind of like you said, you put truth into it, don't you? Sorry, mate. What was you saying? Oh, That's the best advice I ever got on acting. You know, you hear all these kind of long-winded explanations of what acting is and. Someone said to me, hit your mark and find the truth, you know, and it's, um, it's yeah. easier said than done that. You know, when you've got uh, makeup and uh, lights burning in your face and you've got the other actor doing their lines and trying to remember your lines and an accent and all of that, it's easier said than done. But ultimately, that's your job. Like, that, yeah, you that's it. Stuff? I remember my dad, always, my dad said to me from a very young age, he said three things to me about being not about being an actor, just about being an adult. And he always said, well, uh, he said, always be on time, never be late, always learn your lines, don't be a prick. 
They're the three things that he always said to me. <laughs> yeah. Learn your lines, don't be late, don't be a prick. And yeah. they're, the things, they're the three things that I, that I sort of live and you've, by. And, and you've completely ignored him all your yeah, fucking I, life. I've, I've mastered two of them. I've mastered two of them. I'm always on time and I know my lines, but I can't help being a prick. You know what? I mean? you know what? I've, I've always said it like, you know, I, on a good day, I believe this, like, you know, is, is the thing that I, I've done a couple of talks at drama schools and you're talking to students and they're like, well, what's this? What's that? And I said, listen, the first thing you need to learn, like, is the value of please and thank you. You know, I didn't learn that in a drama yeah. school. I think I learned it as a kid. And and um and they'll get you a long way those two things you know yeah, I mean I've learned it sometimes because you know what it's like you get some idiots in the game and who seem to be getting on and stuff in this this age of sort of publicity and false publicity and stuff um but ultimately really like the, the people who've stuck around and the people who've like used to's and, and you know like it's the people who, who are just good people really ultimately yeah. they're the people I think I, that's the important thing I think that is it yeah. and me, me and Andy was very very fortunate that our first director was Shane Meadows and it's like. Yeah. I mean, we and we just learned so so much yeah. overnight. I think you just learn so much overnight when you're working with Shane and people like Mark and people like yourself. We learn a lot from you, learn a lot from Stephen Graham. And you, you know, you, you're learning so much. You could even you can be on set with a with, with a child actor who's seven years old, and you can still learn from them. You can yeah. learn you can learn from yeah. everyone that you meet on yeah. set. And yeah. that's yeah, that's I think you've got thing. it right there about the mag- magpie. Like it is like oh. being a magpie. Yeah. And it's just going. Oh yeah, I like I, okay because. Because I'm like that. I wouldn't say method, but like, yeah, you know what I mean? Sometimes it, you are a little bit method and you, you kind of catch yourself out like, oh, that was a bit like I've not come out of my character all day or, you know what I mean? And, yeah. You know, they, yeah, making different they, things. They up from... said, um, in an interview, like he said, the whole thing's mad, really. Like the whole thing's but like because someone was accusing him of being kind of mental and whatnot. Like, and he said, look. Who's this? Sorry, Johnny. Who's uh, this? Daniel Day-Lewis. Daniel Day-Lewis. Oh, sorry, right, yeah. yeah. He's like one of the ultimate examples of method, I guess, you know, one of the most acute sort of clarifying. <laughs> examples of a method actor and he said yeah. look everything we do is ridiculous we're pretending to be other people you know we're wearing funny costumes we're like everything's ridiculous what does it matter if you're in the corner doing press-ups or like the whole thing's ludicrous really you know like and once you realize that you know and you sort of someone said what is it take take your craft seriously but not yourself you know and yeah I think well, I guess... I think the master at encouraging that isn't he like you know yeah. Yeah. That, you know like it couldn't be um, like I, you know, you, you, you've all got a common purpose on that set, and you're like, it's like you're all fighting for the same cause on that film. You all know why there. It feels personal, doesn't it? That that whole thing that you're doing feels so personal, more than any other set I've ever had it on, to be honest. Yeah, ever. yeah, it's it's, it's so totally. Like when particularly when you've got to take yourself to an emotional state for for a job, I find that when you're on This Is England or when we're on it. You don't even realise that you're doing it. You you just it just happens because yeah. you're so attached to the characters. And when you, when I see Andy Ellis upset, it, that upsets me. Yeah. You know that 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 yeah. me as Tomo upsets me. And yeah. when I see if I see Joe Gilgan upset, that upsets me. So it's kind of funny. But you know when you go on to another set and you've kind of got a and, and you've got to take yourself to this emotional state. I find that the process of getting to to these emotional states. Is so much harder when you're on when I'm on any other job. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's but, yeah. Yeah, but then, like you said, you've got a you've got a because I want it to be real and I, and you want it to be truthful. And Shane you've really got like Shane will protect that. Like any any anything you know. I'll tell you what I do remember right because we didn't have scenes together, but I remember in rehearsals, um, we were all there, weren't we? And we all did different. Yeah. Shane would send me out in the street in the character, you know, and stuff like that. But I remember there was one bit where he had all of you, like we were all doing it. We all took turns to sit in character in a chair and the rest of the cast got to ask you questions and stuff. Yeah. And, um, and you thought, so you thought like, we're all asking Mick questions and you all started getting really angry at me. Like I remember Tomo specifically started going, but why are you doing that to Lola? And then, and then you started getting really protective of Vicky and Lola. Mm. And it well, all, that's it. It's because you, know, you get so attached to these people as characters and as your family as well, you know, like yeah, it, it, it's such a it's such a strange thing. I think yeah. that the whole the whole this is England crew it's mental. And we were talking to Vicky on an earlier podcast, just saying how how weird it'd be to go back now, having learnt so much as actors yeah. now because now we've all we've all grown up and we've got kids and houses and yeah. and we, we take ourselves not ourselves we take our jobs more serious. Like yeah. now, I, I wouldn't dream of going out on the piss now if I know I've got work the day after. Whereas this is England, it's sort of like it, it's the done thing, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas now it'd be interesting because 
I don't know. I don't know how I'd, I would cope. And that was the thing, though, was it in a weird way, like, and, and I'm very, very careful when I say this, like, because there's no excuse for bad behaviour on a set. However, the the atmosphere and the spirit on This Is England was essential to it. Like, the fact that yeah. you that's what I meant about, oh, I had to be separate from it. It wasn't like, oh, I don't want to be with those guys. Like, it was the, that that infectious spirit was the infectious spirit that's on the screen. Like, you believe it on the screen because it's real. And like mm. you guys were like that constantly, all the time. It was fluid. It was fluent, and there was almost no no gap between action and cut, and it just all blurred into one. And yeah, so that's just... why I couldn't be around it. It was it was so real. It was so kind of um, it was beautiful <laughs> and it was lovely, wasn't it? And um, yeah, it really is. It's like no other job. Um, but that we don't. We, yeah, we we we've spoke more, I think, about this is England now than we ever have done on any other episode um but i mean it's great it's great to have you on but um what we do every episode is obviously we get a a guest to come on with a subject that they feel is overrated um and when we was on the phone the other day me and you and we had a chat i we we came up with a few different ones but the one that you settled on was what what which one did you you settle on um, i regret it now i went with fear you went with fear fear is overrated man it's well it's probably the most overrated thing on the planet and that you know like fear it's um you know it's um it's an imposter isn't it you know and um so i went with that and then um and then i was chatting with vicky earlier because like you know you guys know vicky's like my closest friend on yeah. the planet you know we speak every day we you know she's, she's my closest mate and so we were laughing earlier you know because she was telling me her choices and i went oh no i said i think i've gone all serious and i've gone <laughs> no <laughs> it's all good yeah. i mean yeah but I, that's I, the I beauty of it like we have different, you know, we, we have people come on with like really serious stuff like this. You know, people have come on and spoke about all sorts, really kind of serious stuff. And then some people come on and speak about like Stephen came on and spoke about fine dining. You know, Vicky's was centre parks. Like it doesn't matter. They can be ridiculous. They can be specific. They yeah. can be serious. Like, you yeah. know, it's just the, the nature Listen, of it, I guess. I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a male in his 40s. Like, you know, so from I'm at that stage of life where everything's overrated, you know. There comes a point <laughs> where you cross a line where you become a belligerent old fart, you know, and just everything's overrated. So if you tell me something, I can tell you why it's overrated. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, fear is kind of like, you know, and I'm thinking at the moment, obviously, you know, like in a time where yeah. there's justified kind of fear. Like, and, and that's the problem, you know, like you've got to work out the difference in life between fear and prudence, you know, because fear's around for a reason. You know, it, it helps you to, yeah. you know, if you're in a jungle and a lion's running after you, fear will be a good thing. <laughs> It might get you that extra yard, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. But you know, let's face it, ninety percent of the times, like you know, in our society, certainly the Western society, you know, we we live on fear, you know, and so much of it's empty and hollow. And there's a great Mark uh, Mark Twain quote, and he said, um, "I've lived through some terrible, terrible things in my life, and some of them even happened, you know. The rest of them are in my head. Yeah. And it's like yeah. an existent. Tom and I were laughing. We was talking about Ian Brown's. Uh, F-E-A-I, you know, fear. Yeah, it's a great track. Great, great tune. I, I, great I, tune. I, I've been listening to it pretty much on repeat since you sent it to me. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> cool tune, isn't it? You know, but yeah. just the whole thing, like that song breaking it down into sort of anachronisms and stuff. And, you know, it, it's, it's an imposter, isn't it? Like, you know, fear killed more dreams than failure ever did. You know, like it's, it's, yeah. you know. Well, I guess it's kind of like, but it's sort of, it's forced onto us nowadays, though, I think, particularly with social media. Yeah. It's like, I, when when all the you know everything that's going on at the moment with COVID nineteen, um, it is literally when when it all started, I was I, I had my phone in front of my face and I was reading all these things on Facebook that might not necessarily be true. There's a lot a lot of bullshit behind it, but it was scaring me. I was genuinely getting in bed at night and I was thinking, yeah. I've read all this, I've read all that, and now I've got a headache and I don't know what's going on because I, have I got it? And it's like everything that you're reading on online. Yeah. It's just people are out there being scaremongers. That's what they're doing. They're out there and they get they get a buzz off sharing bullshit news that really can affect people. Do you know what I mean? And, and some of that, you know, like on some deep, deep level that I kind of, you know, there's people who are a lot more eloquent than me that can explain it. But like, you know, that's just because they're in fear and their little way of controlling the world that they fear so much is by going out and causing fear, you know, and, and like, you know, that's their way of taking control in it. A, a, a strange so, that, so, so they're not alone in fear yeah it's like you know they don't even know they're doing it it's not like a like this is the problem i think it's so much of it is subconscious we don't even know it 
and 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 even before the internet let's face it our media the very thing that we see probably more than anything else in the world you know that box in the corner of our room it's in our front room probably more than our families and you know like we sit with that box in the corner of the room and don't even get me started on the the, the shit rags and the you, you know like i mean uh, sorry i won't swear but you know like no no it's all the um, but you know like the tabloid newspapers and, and stuff like you know um and, and we've all got That's... friends work in those things and stuff like you know but it is what it is man there's no point dressing it up as anything it's not they're scaremongering that's how they exist like that's yeah, yeah. and that's not a conspiracy theory that's a fact like they exist yeah. it's like these radio shows that stir up debate you know and it's like let's get to the truth and you know you, you could go on there with any subject they will find the debate in it they will find a way of stirring up fear within it because it causes debate and it keeps them in a job and it gets people buying newspapers and, you know, and then there's all sorts of theories that that goes even bigger, you know, that, that that helps the system that we have stay in place, you know. But but ultimately, for whatever reasons they do it, whether we understand them or not, those newspapers pump, pump fear into us every single day. Daily, daily. Like massively. Yeah. And there's no way out of it. And so therefore, no. our, our, you know, our whole subconscious is um, is full of fear. We wake up with it sometimes like, you know, it's just on us constantly. <laughs> And it's, it's interesting now, I don't know about you guys, but this kind of isolation period and, you know, I've kind of got a little understanding of it anyway, because I've just, my life's evolved that way. You know, I've explored things like meditation and stuff for a while now, you know, but, um, and at the risk of sounding sort of pious and hippie and, and whatnot, you know, it works in my life, like, you know, letting go yeah. of fear. Letting go of fear, you know? Well, that's the thing that you've got to do as an individual. You've got to find something that, whether it be sitting on a computer game whether it be sitting and doing a puzzle, whether it's sitting and meditation, if you can find something that takes you away from the fear that is literally forced upon us throughout mm. the day, then that's great. Do you know what I mean? You can you can find solace in that it, it, one hour of meditation or one hour of playing a computer game. Well, one, um, yeah. well, one of the one of the you know the most powerful sources of faith, like because faith is the opposite of fear. The only thing that can beat fear is faith, you know, in something. And so one of the most powerful sources of that is community, is connecting yeah. with others. And um, and so, you know, the, the, the main problem there is, is if you look at these papers consistently throughout history, doesn't matter which um, section of society were the then immigrants, whether it was the Irish or whether it was then the Indians or the West Indians or, you know, the Eastern Europeans or, you know, like whatever section of the community, the papers were pumping hatred at us. What they're yeah. saying ultimately is you are different. You are different. You are different. Do not trust this section of people. They're taking your jobs, your they're robbing your homes there, you know, and it keeps everyone separate. And so, you know, if um, if we're all kept separate like that, then it's hard to have faith. You know, if you don't know each other, we're in an age, mm. where, you know, um, most of us don't know who our neighbours are, you know. And, and so yeah. there's, there's some amazing stuff coming out of this thing now you know we all know that the, yeah the, some the, great great stuff yeah you know there's some like uh, that nhs clap yeah uh, the oh, other it's amazing we are neighbors like my, my two neighbors who are lovely and i've you know deliberately got to know them and um cat and harry and i said to them you know um or they said to me are you going out tonight and i said yeah absolutely but my cynicism and my fear see here you go again my fear was saying well it'll only be us out there you know like but i said yeah i'm going out even if it's just us three let's go out and do it and yeah. um, we live in these blocks, so it was just us talking about it. And then we went out at eight o'clock, the whole block. I saw, oh, I saw on your Instagram, it was yeah. amazing. I mean, honestly, I, I got emotional. My sister's mm. working on the front line, you know. She's not NHS, but she's a, she's a manageress of a boots uh, chemist, you know. And she's there with people screaming at her and, you know, and, and all of that. And, um, and you know, and, and uh, I thought of her that night and I heard that applause and, I got emotional, mate, you know, and, and yeah. came into my flat that night. I don't know about you, but I was buzzing. I was alive. And I'll tell you what I was. I was fearless. In that, yeah. I was fearless. I believed in my community around me. I believed in, you know, um, people and uh, my sister and things like that. And I felt full of faith. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's good. It's good that things like that, like. I remember when I first saw the, the 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 poster that had been posted on Instagram that uh, um, on the Monday everyone was going to clap for the NHS um, at eight o'clock, and I thought oh, that's a great idea, that's a great. And then suddenly that then snowballed, and everybody was sharing it. Yeah. Everybody knew about it, and I was thinking, this is the shit I want to see. Yeah, I want to yeah. see this. 
yeah. I want to go on my Instagram and see, wow, that's happening, or something. Something else came up on mine earlier on that um, there was a, a a very small cul-de-sac, um, and there's a little lonely old lady, and they created a WhatsApp WhatsApp group of I don't know, maybe eight of eight or nine neighbours, and this little old lady, she said she was really struggling, she was really lonely. So what these guys did is they went onto the front of, in a distance and they all had a cup of tea and just chatted with each other with yeah. this old lady who was said that she was struggling and she was feeling lonely. And I thought, well, that's such a great, like, it's such a great thing for the community to do to, to yeah. actually help each other. Do you know what I mean? Instead yeah. of just going, oh, miserable Barbara at 94, yeah. you know, she's yeah. fucking mad. Eh? Yeah. You know, it's, it's, and it's nice that all these things are, they're the only things that I'll share on social media, like the, the clap for the NHS and the good news and yeah. the progress that the NHS are making with the virus. I'm yeah. not, I, I, you know, I'm, I'll avoid all the, all the, the bad news because th- th- that's what society is at the minute. It's just full of bad news. So, yeah. y- you know, if you can try and share a good bit of news, then you certainly should, you know. We've got a common peril for the first time in our generation, really. I'm thinking like, you know, unless it's sort of... um. Like, you know, you get other examples, like there's, you know, like if it snows or something, for example, you just feel a bit of a difference in the air. We've all got a common yeah. problem. Like sometimes you see people nodding at each other in the street when it snows and because we're all surprised by this common event, you know? Yeah. On a, on a more sort of a dark level, you know, wars bring people together, like things like that. When there's common tragedy, common, it brings qualities out that we just never knew were in people. Our family yeah. members, um, we see people in a different light and... I think with this thing, it's the first time in probably our generation where we've had a, a genuine common peril. And also because we're all going through it. The whole world as well. Yeah. Like, it's never it's been the whole world either, yeah. has it, I guess? Do you well, know what I mean? There's a genuine countries. sort of threat and there's, you know, and we're right to fear it, you know? Fear yeah. is a good Fear, like it's, it's like anything. I'm not saying like don't have fear. I'm just saying it's overrated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, and it, like you said, you wash your hands, great. You know, if yeah. fear makes you be careful, if it makes you look out for your neighbour, great. But it's like it's like for every sin, there's a virtue, and the line mm. between the two is always blurred. One minute you're yeah. sitting in happy solitude, and you're thinking I could do this for the rest of my life, without even knowing it, it's turned into isolation and fear, yeah. and you don't know it. Like you know, and it's the same with. Um, you know love and lust or you know with like with anything like you know one minute you're in the virtuous sort of version of it and uh and then if you're not mindful you know you've slipped into well it's human actually to to go that way but we need to be mindful of it so we can get yeah. back to it. and it's very difficult to do that when en masse um the the majority of our mainstream media and politics you know are pumping fear us i'm even to be honest um i loathe politics loathe it with a passion i loathe all of them it's the truth of it you know i'm a, look yeah. You know, I'm a staunch uh, uh, Labour voter, you know, but um, but the whole Blair thing even rocked that for me, you know, like just, you know, like so politics in general for me is a just something it's, the, you know, it's something I leave to other people in many ways. But um, and it's not apathy. You know, I feel deeply, yeah, passionate, yeah. but it really upsets me. But, the, you know, um, even that at the moment, you know, even our politicians, they're not just doing this childish, like tiring, childish energy sapping soul destroying shouting across the room at each other where we're all watching it and just it's breaking our souls i think because these are yeah. the people are meant to be leading us and at the moment even they're talking with a common purpose you know even like boris or whoever you know like you know th- there's a chance here i'm not saying we'll take it and i'm not saying it it will go that way but there's definitely a it's the biggest chance we've ever had of change ever yeah um, yeah well I, i've said this I've said this a couple of times, probably on the podcast now to a few people, but the way I'm seeing this, hopefully, is, um, you know, when, like, you see in films or you might have heard of a friend or someone who's had, like, a a bit of a health scare, you know, the doctor said, oh, if you don't stop smoking, you're going to get this or whatever. Um, This is, like, humanity's health scare. This should be now us going, right, no, we need to live every day now, like, it's it's the best, like, you know, after this, so... Yeah. hopefully things will change and, and we'll treat the planet a bit better and you know because things like global warming a lot of people don't you know kind of think oh it's years away it's years away it's not like this should now show us that catastrophe can be tomorrow you know whether yeah. it's another pandemic or it's war or whatever yeah. you know it's hopefully yeah people will grow from this i think it's a chance man like you know look the, the reality of this would probably <clears throat> some bits and leave some bits behind and go back to normal and on, on other bits and, and whatever. But there, there is genuinely a chance. I think yeah. for the first time ever, probably in most of our lives, um, we've had a little taste of it, of what it might be like, you yeah. know, 
It's yeah. hard when, like, like, in everyday life, right, if you've got some sort of left winger or some sort of spiritual guru spouting this stuff and saying, well, this would be lovely and that would be lovely, it's very hard to even contemplate it when you've then got that hub and that machine pumping the other message at you, saying, no, you need more, you need this. But at the moment, we're all trapped at home. There is no mythical race out there at the moment that we're missing yeah. out on. There's no mythical party out there that we're missing out on. You know, there's no money out there to be chased and earned because we all need it because the papers are telling us we do because we haven't got the same amount as flipping Kardashian or whoever. You know, like, um, I, I don't even know the girls, so I shouldn't say that, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah. you know, you're right, you're right. Because, like, you know, this mythical competition that's pumped yeah. into us. And at the moment, there is no competition. We're all in the same boat. Everyone. Yeah. We're all in the same boat. And it's like a, I think I even get it now, just sitting at home on my own with nothing really to do, you know, other than stay calm, help me little family, you know, my mum lives up not, not too far, you know, like little things where you go, right, that's all we've got to do and that's it. And then out of nowhere, you'll go to bed. Some nights I can go to bed with complete faith in the world, you know, complete mm. faith. I put my head on the pillow and I wake up the next morning and I don't know what's happened overnight and I don't know how they've climbed into my ear or whatever, but it seems like people have climbed in and it's turned into World War Three, and I wake up yeah. in fear again. And it's like, and that's when I have to do things to combat that, like meditation and stuff, just to get myself centered back and go, no, hold on, everything's okay. Everything. Yeah, yeah. I woke up the other morning feeling that, like feeling like, you know what, this is all very lovely and it's all good and whatever, but I do need to be doing things. You know, I've got to write King Lear or I've got to write King, like there's things I've got to be doing. And then I was reminded again, no, no one's doing anything. And I think that's really helpful is knowing that it's happening en masse yeah. everywhere, that we, we're all in this period of just all we have to do at the moment is nothing. And, it's a weird, yeah. it's a weird time. It's like, you, all, when, when there isn't a global pandemic, if you sit around the house all day and do nothing and don't get dressed until three in the afternoon, you feel guilty about doing that. Whereas now it is literally, it's guilt free time to spend time with your families and communicate with people. Where, obviously we can't do it face to face, which is a shame, but you know, even like us catching up now over this, you yeah. know, it, it's a great time for people like, you know, the, the the This Is England group chat thing we've got going on, which Johnny's not part of, actually. I didn't think oh, about I that. I have not a single one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, this, I'm, I'm going to join that one then. Yeah, yeah we'll get, yeah, get in it, get in it, yeah. Well, um, but every, everyone's getting these group chats and everyone's and everyone's becoming closer and everyone's sort of spending more time wondering how everyone's getting on do you know what i mean because yeah. we've got nothing but time to check in on each other yeah. so the the whole fear of, of everything that's going on outside the good is happening inside i think and it, it's, yeah. it's good that that the public are finally listening that you you need to stay inside it's as simple as that no, yeah, well, i mean I, yeah I, 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 my, yeah go on andy go on mate i was gonna say for my like personal one with that like you say like you know i've i I'm kind of lucky in a way because with our kind of job, we, we do kind of spend a lot of time at home and then we go away for a little bit and whatnot. But I'm spending time like with my family. Like, you know, there's the four of us, we're all stuck in together and it's like, you know, I'm I'm, I'm teaching my little girls things that I'd, I I wouldn't have time to do, you know, we've been doing this and that. And, and I think, obviously, like I say, I've always kind of had that anyway, but there's probably fathers and mothers out there that, work nine to five office jobs or whatever who have now got that with the kids and it's such a nice thing to 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 be a part of I guess like my little girl um my oldest because she'll remember it she'll always remember this as probably one of the happiest times of her life I think mm. which which is which is amazing she'll always remember that long summer that she had off school and we just played all day and we watched tv oh, and we, we, we baked you know what I mean and, and that's mm. That's the nice thing, I guess, from it. Do you know what I mean? Well, I, I, keep, keep any change, it. any change is instigated out of love. Like you can't, yeah. can't um, demand people change. You just can't. You can't have a war for peace. It never works. You know, like it does. It simply doesn't work as a philosophy. So, you know, it will always grow again. And and you know, any real fundamental, genuine change comes out of experiencing the good version. You know, so like you can't yeah. say, so, like I heard a guy today, right? Um, I went out today for the first time in 10 days and I went and got my little food shop and, um, you know, and it was silent out, you know, like, and I live in a busy, I live in the Elephant and Castle, like I live in a busy, busy, very sort of, you know, um, uh, heavily um, populated area of London, you know, and it's, and it was quiet out, you know, the air feels clean, 
like the air just feels mm. clean. No scientific fact to back that up. All I'll say is the air felt clean, you know. Wow. Um, and I was walking up, you know, and it was kind of silent out, and people were queuing up orderly outside the supermarket because we have to. We have to keep distance. This thing's forcing us to do it. And um, so that was nice, seeing people queue up in an orderly fashion, you know. Yeah. Um, but a guy went past in a car, and he was stopped at the lights, right? And he had this kind of very, very intense music coming out, right? It was, it was by anyone's – it doesn't matter what genre it was, but it was aggressive, you know. It was – like I heard the word bitch like four times, you know, when you're just like, it was dense music. And um, now you could try and force that guy in a set. Like I, I would want to impose my will on that and go, mate, turn the music off, will you? We're not in the ghetto, you know, like there is no ghetto. If you feel like you're in the ghetto, it's in your head. Because at the moment, everyone's just relaxed and calm. And there's bigger problems. Like, you know, it, it just right sizes everything. And, um, and, and I think, like, you know, you can't tell people what to listen to, what not to do, what not ever. I think people have just got to slowly enjoy the silence. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, and, and maybe that guy will eventually be overcome with that and think, you know what? I quite like being in peace. I don't want It's a very calm time. Yeah. Very, uh, things are very calm, aren't they? And I've noticed that people are very... Um, People in the streets, if you are queuing for the supermarket, people are being really friendly and gentle and, and caring about each other, caring about strangers and people they don't know. Yeah. You know, whereas it, it, it could it could have gone the other way. It could have gone people badging everyone out of the way. God, I need to get the... Yeah. Whereas it seems like now everyone's taking it serious and everyone's on the same sort of page that people just, yeah, like you said, people just want a bit of calm and tranquility and just to just try and put whatever's going on to the back of their minds. That's a good example. I, th I think if I'm right, like, and again, we're generalizing here, but, and, and again, it's that fear machine that tells us the news. Like I stopped reading the papers genuinely. I genuinely, like Vicky, I tell you this, I stopped. It was a, it was a decision almost like about, it's got to be five years ago, something like that. Like it was, it's a good, good period of time now where I deliberately made a choice not to read the newspapers. Now I'm on social media. I've got um, Instagram and I've got, you know, so, uh, and a Facebook where I keep in touch with my friends and family. But like, so roughly speaking, like I'm going to see the news. Like the fear is then is that I'll yeah. miss out on something. You know, I'm going to miss out if I don't read the news and, you know, or, or whatever. And um, it's just not true. I, I, I can't quantify it. Like, you know, there's certain celebrities and that, that I don't know the name of. I like that. Like, I love it. Like, I, yeah. like Vicky winds me up about it, you know, because she'll say to me, oh, have you heard what's happening? Well, what? Like, I don't know who that is. And she laughs. <laughs> I know it's true. And then she laughs, she winds me up, she thinks I'm a miserable old kid. But the truth of it is, like, is it makes me really happy not to know. I don't really want to know. What the yeah, like ignorance is bliss yeah. almost. I don't want to know that nonsense. It says, there's a great old Smith song, Panic. Panic on the yeah, street. Panic, um, panic on the streets of London. Street. Yeah, yeah. And then there's a lovely line. He says, hang the blessed DJ because the music that he constantly plays, it says nothing to me about my life. And that's the media for me. Like, hang the blessed media because the, what they pump down my throat, it says nothing to me. It doesn't matter to me how many millions Simon Cowell's worth. It means nothing to me. You know, I yeah. want to know how my sister is. I want to know how my nephews are. I want to know how Vicky's getting on today. You know, yeah. like, like, does my neighbour need a little bit of food? You know, like, real things. Real things. And I don't want to set myself yeah. up like an angel here. We're all in this world. We're all... You know, like I'm as fearful as the next man. This is what I'm saying. There's no such thing as the absence of fear. Someone said that courage is not the absence of fear. It's doing things despite fear. You know? Yeah, yeah. Just think once you do that a few times and you break the myth, you know, um, and it's a daily thing. Like I say, I can have this now some days and think I've got this sussed. I'm fearless. And, and, I, and the world is a beautiful place and it's going to give to me as much as I give to it. And I believe in that, you know. As much as I, the next day, I'll be full of fear again, you know, because that's just. Yeah. How it is. But on a daily basis, the more fear I've been able to put aside, some of the some of the greatest things I've ever done in my life, the, the experiences I look back on and think, like, I can't believe that's possible, including This Is England, including all of those things. That's why Shane's such a great director is what he does is he removes the fear for you. Yeah. I, I, let's face it. I've worked with other directors and they kind of bring fear to the set a little bit. And it stifles everyone, you know, mm. um, whereas Shane's kind of like, mm. yeah. I always remember when we done that exercise where you guys were asking me questions and everything. And I was sitting there and I got quite tense, right? Like, you know, because there was an energy. You guys were attacking me. And, and I remember getting a bit tense. And I would wanted to try this thing with my jaw, you know, this thing. It's like, a, like I've got an uncle who does it. And I just kind of thought, I'll, 
And I tried it once before on another project and the director belittled me. I was like, I was unknown as an actor and the director made a joke and said, what's that thing you're doing with your jaw? And I said, oh, it's something when he gets tense, I'm wondering if it might work. And they just laughed at it and went like, no, it looks a bit weird, mate, you know? And, it, and I didn't, I was too young to, or too immature or too scared, too fearful yeah. to argue, you know, or to make my point or to be brave enough to try it. And um, so I just let it go and, and it embarrassed me a bit. So I never did it again. And then during that exercise with you lot, something happened where I was getting tense and I, and I just did it. I started to do it, you know, and the breathing thing. And um, I remember the breathing so vividly. Yeah, I, I remember, remember that. Yeah. And Catherine's so done, vividly. Um, done the beard because I'd seen a postcard of the screen, Monk's uh, painting the screen. And, and he's yeah, yeah. long. And I, and I remember Catherine angled the beard downwards and we started to find the character. And uh, and then I started doing that jaw thing in the rehearsal. And this long place. <laughs> He was like, we're all getting angry with him. And it, and then and then Shane called Cut. And he went, what's that thing you're doing with your chin, buddy? Uh, with your jaw? And I, and, uh, and I thought, oh, no. In my head, I thought, ah. Oh. And I went, yeah, no, don't worry about it. It's all right. It's just something I was trying, but I can get rid of it. He went, no, more of that, buddy. It's terrifying. He said, I love it. And he just encouraged me. <laughs> your you know? shade of pressure is amazing, man. Yeah. It's so smart. Yeah, it's wonderful, isn't it? <laughs> it's <laughs> it's just like one. watching... Shane appear out of nowhere. <laughs> he does a good one of me, apparently. He kills me, apparently. <laughs> and, uh, I always get I, I always get scared when people say, Oh, my mate, my mate does a great impression of you. I'm like, Oh, oh yeah. my god. It's and then you watch it like stop it like me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you yeah, yeah, that's he it. The that third much. he took fear away. You know, he took fear mm. away. And then like it, you feel like you can fly, can't you? You know, it's like um you know, and um yeah, fear, man. It's you know, look, the the more I've let go of it over the years, and I've worked hard at it. You know, it was kind of part of um, you know, I won't go too much into it, but like part of me getting sober, really. You know, like because I, I didn't realise I was scared. That's the other problem. I grew up yeah. as a kid. I'd found all sorts of ways to yeah. say to the world, I'm not scared. You know, I, I was a champion boxer at 16, and you know, and and if you'd have looked at me on the outside, you know, national champion as a boxer, uh, then became kind of an actor, you know, performing in front of people in little theatres and stuff, and you'd have looked at that bloke, and especially if I had a drink in me, you know, like, you know, we all think we're Superman when we've had a, a beer, you know, but you'd have looked at him and thought, he's fearless, he's fearless, you know, and all the men I grew up with, I looked at and thought, they're fearless, that is fearlessness, you know, I grew up in quite a sort of... Um, you know, um, aggressive area, really, you know, and you'd sort of look at those people and think they're fearless. And the more I've kind of got sober, I guess, and the more I've kind of explored this principle of fearlessness and fear and faith, um, the, I realised I was terrified as a kid. Terrified. The reason I went to that boxing club, it's the reason I wrote my film, Jawbone, is, is because that place was like my church. That place was the place I went to. I didn't know this. I just went there and punched a bag. But when I look back on it now, with the knowledge I've got now about things like meditation and things like that, I realise that that boxing club was my church. When you're in that ring, they like because they say meditation is in the dictionary. One of the definitions of it is a period of concentrated thought. That's it. You don't have to be wearing robes. You don't have to be sitting cross-legged. You don't have to be on top of a mountain. It's a period of concentrated thought. Read a book. Yeah. Listen to Read a book. Go for a run. Anything. What you listen to. I watched the movie. As, as random as it sounds, like um, I, I, I find I used to hate doing it, washing pots. But yeah. now I use that now, like, you know, I'll be like, I'll do it, I'll do the pots. And I'll yeah. just stand there for a good 10 minutes. And it's just like concentrating on that. And that's yeah. all I need to focus on. And it's so, it's, just, it's you know, it's, it's the most boring of tasks that you have to do. But it actually, you know at what? the end of it, like, well, oh, that's the that's reason nice. I want to write um, Jawbone. You know, people think maybe it's a boxing film. It's not, it's a spiritual film. And the reason it's that is because I realized once I learned it in later life, in sort of yeah. sobriety, I, I kind of um, I realized then that that boxing club, you know, when someone's throwing punches at you in the ring, you know, you're not thinking about two seconds ahead or, or what happened this afternoon. You're, totally in the present you know because yeah. that spirituality is based around is living in the present moment and not living in the future because you'll fear you'll fear it you fear things that aren't even going to happen you know or you'll be full of shame or uh, remorse about things in your past but you know when you're in the present everything's perfect everything is perfect when you're in the present moment like right right now you need nothing else you might want more. You might want to win the lottery. You might want to get the girl. You might want to get all of these things that Hollywood tell you this is going to make you happy. If you yeah, get, yeah. if you, uh, you know, win the world title, if you do this, then you'll be happy. 
It's a myth. Yeah, it's a happiness myth. is in the journey, right? Oh, happiness is the... Believe me, like, you don't have to journey trust to your own journeys to, to pull from. But all of us, mm-hmm. anyone who's listening to this, like, if you think about your... Like, right now, in this moment, you've got everything you need. And I don't say that flippantly. Like, I've, I've been skint. I've been more skint than most in some time in my life. Like, you know, like, um, I'm from a working class back. You know, we all are, like, you know. So I'm not saying this flippantly. It ain't about that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking right here, right now. If you've got a faith in something that's bigger than yourself, you'll realize you're okay. You're okay right now. And if you're able to sit with that without the fear, you will find the next right step to take in life. You will find it. But fear, when it's pumped at you, man, it will cripple you. You know, sometimes you can't even get off the couch for fear. It's like procrastination like, or, or sloth was the old word for procrastination. Someone said it's yeah. uh, sloth in five syllables. It's the same thing, you know, but... And it looks like laziness. You know, when you see someone who's slothful or procrastinating, you know, and they're on the couch and you think, well, get up and write that book, you lazy git, whatever. It, like, it's not laziness. It's fear. Fear of living. Yeah, something's holding them back. I can't write that book. I'm, you know, I'm too young to do that or I'm too old to do that or yeah. I'm too big to go and do that. It, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It's, because you feel like you're not good enough. And that's why it's hard when you've got the newspapers saying, well, these people are brilliant. These people are beautiful and these people have, you know, got billions and these people are great and these people are doing things you could never dream of. It's all making you feel like you're not good enough. But that, it, that, that's, I think, sorry, go on, Johnny, go on, go on. No, go on. that's what we're realising now. The, the people, yeah, yeah, like, exactly. You know, the people who, who deliver our letters, the people like my sister on the front line in Boots, the chemists and the NHSs and the, you know, the, now we're realising where real value is, you know? Where's the worth in what those people are earning millions around? What's it worth now? Nothing. They're still sat in isolation, exactly the same of us. You know, someone gets entertainment from it or something. I don't know, you know, but like, where's the real, the real tangible worth of it now? You know, like I tell you where you're going to find your worth now is your, 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 your friend or your family member who's going to be there when you're a bit down, you know, like, and, um, you know, yeah, I'm getting heavy, aren't I? (laughs) No, no, genuinely, mate, I could lit, I was just literally thinking just then I could listen to you talking all day because you're talking so much sense and, uh, and and the respect that that you have for people is like it's just admirable really but it's true what you say about the about the media and and how they portray they they can make people feel like they're not good enough young girls for instance say they they're seeing all these these big superstars in LA with the with the lip fillers and the, and the and the bodies that are all perfect and the really long beautiful hair and then there's young girls who haven't got the the money or the resources for that so they feel inadequate. They feel like they're not good enough to be out on the street. And then, and then that can spiral into a whole different state of depression and anxiety and things like that. And I guess that's that's what the, the media and social media are doing is it's I, I just they're just contributing towards the, the downfall of society in a way for the people who are vulnerable to it. Do you know what I mean? Social media is interesting, isn't it? It's like it's beyond my scope. I, I don't know what I'm talking about, really. But, the you know, the, the idea that at least with that, there's balance. Like when it comes through a sort of a channeled media, you know, like, like yeah. let's say, for, for argument's sake, just to keep the numbers simple, let's say you've got four national newspapers and two television channels, you know, when that's your sole mode of information, your sole mode of communication, um, then you can only hope that those people are virtuous and good and wanting good for everyone else. Because if they're not, we're in trouble because there's nothing to balance. Those sources of media say uh, this is bad and that's bad and you should be scared of this. There's nothing to counterbalance it and go, well, hold on, hold on. We're going to be all right here. You know, like there's no there's no balance really to that. There is with good media and good journalism. And and I'm, mm. I'm a great, great fan of that. I think, you know, when when a, a kind of um, a channeled media like that, um you know with great journalism i'm talking about people who can really write and people who you know have have, um achieved some sort of awakening in life where they're able to report um with balance and with faith and with hope and they can report the stuff that we're meant to be fearing uh, fearing you know but they do it with balance then and it's it's um yeah balanced journalism is a wonderful wonderful thing but we don't have that in in the majority now i would say of our journalists and so the social media thing's interesting in that look it's like the wild west at the moment it's it's a free isn't it everyone's fighting for uh, land you know it's it's like you know we've all rushed over to america and all trying to grab our little acre you know it's like it's it's chaos like you know but maybe out of that at least there's hope in that in some ways maybe not but 
that the, the people like the trolls and the, you know they're never gonna you're never gonna scream at them enough you know like you you can smash those guys in the face in anger you're not all you're gonna do is st- you're, you're you're still kind of um you're confirming their own self-loathing really yeah. really if someone well, you said to them listen we've all kind of been there in our own ways i've never done that trolling because it's never been my thing but you know we've all in our own ways degraded ourselves in life in some way or another right yeah. like we just have in one way or another whether it's with booze whether it's with whatever because on some levels we we feel like we're self-loathing or we're not good enough. We've all gone through those stages in our life, you know. And if someone during that time has a go at you and says, you see you, you're disgraceful, you're letting your family, you know. If anything, it just confirms your self-loathing. The most painful thing that someone can do in that time is turn around and say, I love you. I love you, you know. Someone said to me once, I'm not religious. I'm not religious, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm spiritual, you know. I've, I've, I don't even know if I'm spiritual. Look, I'm a human being who... Yeah explores certain spiritual principles because because they work you know and um someone said to me once and i was i was really down on my luck and it was it's kind of like what what my film jawbone's about it's it's all about that and um and someone who i love very dearly said to me said i love you and god loves you and there's nothing you can do about it you can carry on killing yourself you can carry on smashing yourself to pieces but i love you and god loves you and there's nothing you can do about it and it's that love's the thing that will change people it really will yeah i, I don't yeah. like Anyone who's been worth anything in history, in, in my book, just, you know, there are capitalists out there maybe disagree. They've got their own heroes. That's fine. I, I defend their right to have that. But for me, anyone in history who's worth two bob um, has come from that angle. I don't care who it is. Gandhi, John Lennon, uh, mm. you know, anyone, like anyone, great, great spiritual leaders, Buddha, uh, Muhammad Ali, you know, um, Malcolm X. Or, or, you know, uh, Martin Luther King, um, Dylan, you know, like anyone, anyone who's got anything really worthwhile listening to has often always said that love is the answer. And I just believe yeah. those guys more than I believe my media. That, that yeah. some, the answer is going and bombing the arse out of someone or, or pouring bombs down on kids. And I just don't believe that's the truth, I'm afraid. And and um, no, and it's not the right way to, to go about it, I don't think. And it is amazing how they get away with that I just what would it take for for them to stop particularly with 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 the things that the that these tabloids are are printing they've got there's no facts behind them and they're openly able to abuse certain celebrities and people in the limelight to the point where you know people's lives are being taken and nothing's happening to to this to these people you know but but, well something is happening and it's not a good thing and what's happening is is people are still buying them yeah so yeah. costas, there's there's also, also, it's not always a positive thing that happens. We have to accept that, man. We're flawed as yeah. people. It's in our nature to be. Like it's like mm. I said, for every seven virtues, there's seven sins. Like my my ludicrously like simple understanding of it, and and I don't, you know, shout like this is not something I'm professing onto other people. I'm just saying it keeps me happy in life, you know. But there are seven sins and there are seven virtues, you know. Like there's love, whatever they are, you know, like on, on the sinful side, you've got anger, jealousy, envy, you know, sloth. Um, on the virtuous side, you've got patience, tolerance, kindness, love. You know, you've got seven of each, roughly speaking, to keep it simple. And each day is um, a battle, I guess, or a dance between the two. And we all wake up with a choice each morning to say, you know, I'm feeling angry. I'm feeling this. I'm feeling that. But what I really want to be is charitable. I want to be helpful. I want to be happy. You know, I want to be happy. And, um, you know, like that, for example, helping others. You know, I never realized that, like, um, it's probably the greatest source of happiness you will ever tap into. I never realized because I grew up with the opposite mantras. I grew up with the kind of mantras that all my parents, like my mum and my uncles and everyone, we all grew up with that thing of like, you know, you keep yourself to yourself. If someone hits you, you hit them back twice as hard, you know, um, you know, you, you, you know, don't share your secrets. And, and, and like, that's the stuff that will kill you. You know, I learned that in later life, like the virtues say the opposite. The virtues say share, build community, you know, help others, you know, um, like faith, hope and charity, really. That's the sort of pyramid that most spiritual faiths are built on faith hope and charity keep a clean house trust god and help others so you know trust something bigger than you we're all having to do that at the moment yeah yeah we're all having to trust something's going to get us through you know trust in that and um help others where you can 
And if you've got something that's really a dark secret or something that you need to get out, get it out. You know, whereas what we've got with our media is like this shame culture. You know, they're constantly shaming people for their sexual things or whatever. And it's like, rah. And then we're all laughing at those people. And it's, it's horrible. Like you said, uh, this, I don't want to mention names because it's, you know, but people have taken their lives recently and that. And it's like this shame, like shaming people and saying they're different yeah. from us. And they're not. Whatever that young girl went through recently, we've all gone through it at some point. 100%. Yeah, 100%. I, I we all have. to go through because I don't know anything about it. But, you know, I know a little bit from talking with friends and, you know, but like, um, whatever you know like you've seen people commit suicide because they've been shamed in the media and stuff and you're just like hold on we're all doing that aren't we what did they do what i don't know you know we all know the things that we do where you think other people don't know that you know or whatever you know we're we're all human beings man we're all human beings and the more we um realize that and and i and i think what you need for that to happen is um you know it's not some stern lecture from some like in head teacher it's it's feeling the opposite. It's feeling yeah. a bit, feeling a bit of compassion for your fellow man, you know, someone who you judge um, and you kind of ridicule. All of a sudden, you see them as an actual person, and it feels better than judging and ridic- ridiculing them, you know. And and um, that's how people will change eventually, I guess. Like on an individual level, who knows whether that could expand? Who knows? None of us really know. And, and my fear, my fear tells me it can't happen. It's just too big a thing. But yeah. I have little pockets in my life where I've seen it work. I've seen yeah, that's it. I mean, a true democracy at, at, at work. And it can happen. You know, where if people have got like a common peril or a common cause, you will be amazed at the people that come together. Mm. I've heard stories about like, you know, um, you know, if people have a common peril, like, you know, like 12 step fellowships or things, you know, and there's stories like in Northern Ireland. You had people from the Catholic and the Protestant sides coming together. I remember yeah. when Barry McGuigan fought for the world title and like, because they all wanted a hero and he was it at the time. And, and you had people from the, you know, these people were killing each other and every day and yet they'd all come together for that common purpose. And yeah, this, yeah. You know, like, we all need a common purpose. And um, it's right there in front of us, really. It's life, you know, but it's hard to um, make that your, your goal, your common purpose when everyone else is telling you that ultimately in one form or another, it's money. Yeah. It's money. You know, like that's what our security is. Now, money is our God. You know, um, I'm not saying whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. It is what it is. It's it's quite brilliant. Whoever invented it is, is you know, clearly um, it's a genius system in, in many ways and whatever. But um, but whether we like it or not, that is our God. That's the thing. Yeah. That we that's the thing that we go. It's a with. shame that something like that just makes the world go round, isn't it? And everyone thinks that that's the root to the happiness. But, you know, sadly. It, well, in, in in a lot of cases, it's proven that it isn't, you know. Well, the truth is, I guess, really, ultimately, it's balance, isn't it? This is what I'm trying to say. There is no virtuous life where we're all going to float around in robes and bowing at each other. And, you know what I mean? Like, but unless the right job comes in and we're asked to audition for it, and then we'll do it, <laughs> floating around. <laughs> the, the truth is, it's balance, isn't it? There's never going to be a world yeah. of fear because we're human beings and we need fear in many ways. But it's balance. It's keeping it balanced with faith and remembering that there's lots of wonderful things out there there's amazing things for everything that this paper tells you about knife crime and this and that what they're not telling you is the million stories of good things that happen in the world that day you know yeah it's, we, yeah. it's, it's like now that. every yeah. every day you're hearing x amount of people have died from this horrible disease and that is horrible yeah but what they're not printing is how many people are walking out of that hospital healthy yeah you know and and, and that's yeah. that's true there's there's so many people you know surviving this and 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 carrying on and stuff but mm. unfortunately the, the thing that sells the papers the thing that keeps the news channels going like you said before is how many people have died from it today yeah and that's horrible yeah, and what and one death is too bad. many but yeah. i i I, th- I think we live in a society where people certain people feel that like they they the people thrive off that sort of information more than they would have been a bit of good people thrive off the bad news more than they would have the good news do you know what i mean and well, it's this, kind of a sad big, reality that sorry tom i better write no, go on go on mate go on, go on, go, on. Go, on. go on i better write into you yeah go on no i just just saying that it's it's a sad reality that some certain people would would they they'd they'd share a bad news story quicker than they would share a news a new good a, a a good news story on social media, wouldn't they? Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, and in some ways that's, you know, and we're all capable of it. 
Like that's the yeah. first step is is recognizing that we are like everything that we loathe in other people, we are capable of it on some level. It's hard to describe yeah, that with specific yeah. examples. But if you said to me now about I don't know Trump or something like and a, you know an easy target, something that we all go that's bad or you know. On some level, if we, if we got down to it and looked at it and worked out what it was about him that you didn't like, it's because ultimately it's reminding you of something in yourself. Ultimately, whether it's yeah. self-centeredness or um, a self of, you know, it's because somewhere in your little secret life or your head or whatever, you know, that's um, who you are as well. We're all the same, man. It's like in many ways, like, you know, it's painfully predictable, really. You know, we're all the same. We're all the same. Yeah. If you see someone, um, and sometimes it's scary for us. It just is scary to accept that that's part of us as well. Um, it is scary. Like we'd much rather go, you know, point the finger at them and go, "Wow, they're just bad. They're different. They're different. They're different." And you're like, "They're not, man. They're just, um, they're just struggling today and, and misbehaving as a result." And um, and that's that's the thing. Like I do believe I, it's too hard for me to get me ready. You know, like I just try and do it as much as I can in my daily life, and I foul more than I succeed i guess maybe i don't know but um but it's lovely to have a bit of that balance it's lovely to have a bit of serenity every now and again a bit of peace and quiet a bit of um compassion it feels good that's the problem right is well not the problem the opposite that's the the mad thing about it is it feels good you know if you're able to you know and there's nothing to it really like spirituality and that this is the other thing at the moment as well where like you know everyone's spouting on about spirituality and attaching it almost to sort of some you know, the, the, the price of your flipping yoga mat or something. It's like a fashion accessory. And it's like, no, it ain't. Yeah. Spirituality is going to making someone a cup of tea. You know, mm. giving that person a phone call that you don't really want to ring just to see how they are. Try doing it. Not because like some pompous ass is telling you that you've got to do it to be part of some sort of spiritual group because it feels good. I'll tell you the most spiritual people are right now. Like, it ain't people floating around on a mountain, you know, like, the, the, you know, or people who are online telling you that you how to live your life. You know, the most spiritual people right now are mothers. They're nurses, you know. Mm. They're turning up and doing it, man, you know, anonymously in most cases. Like, that's the other great thing about spirituality is when people do it anonymously. Someone anonymously, said, yeah. the spiritual thing you can do today is go out and do something kind for someone without getting found out about it. If you get found out, it doesn't count yeah try it go out and do something kind for someone today it can be small it can be large it can be whatever but just go out and do something anonymously for someone and they won't even know you've done it see how you feel later when you're sitting indoors trust me you know it's the opposite of how a troll feels when he's just put out some horrible spiteful thing that poor soul that troll whatever trust me they ain't in a good place no that ain't a nice place to be in it really ain't because we've all done it on some level or another like, I've never trolled, I don't think, I don't think I've, but you know, like, I've never, that's not, just not my thing, like, I'm, I'm, you know, but on some level or another, we've all been spiteful at some time in our life, or we've all, yeah. gossip, gossip's another thing, like, you know, we've all at some point had a gossip about someone, yeah. who kind of feels good and they've got on our nerves or whatever, doesn't feel good, karmically, mm. on some level, you know that you're, you're breaking the rules of life in some spiritual cosmos, <laughs> I can't believe I'm yeah. saying, but, you know, but, no, but I, I agree, though. I, I agree. Something totally. kind for someone and you don't get found out about it. Just for today. See how you feel later. It's a lovely feeling. It's a lovely, lovely feeling, you know? Like, yeah. You know. I think with that, with that, then, with that <laughs> advice, <laughs> honestly, that, that is the perfect place to end. If you are listening to this podcast, yeah. do as, as, as Johnny's just said, if you can go out safely, obviously, because of, of what's going on, and, you know, check on a neighbour or, like you say, ring that friend that you've probably not spoke to for a while send or... a text or even if you don't yeah. go out tell you the hardest thing is to ring someone up and make it completely about them you know yeah like where, about where their day, it's yeah. not like you know you don't get into what you're going through and your troubles for the day it's hard it's hard man this is an exercise here try it people like it's i'm hard. gonna write them down if you're but a self-centered git like me like, all i want to do is ring up and talk about me <laughs> <You know? laughs> no, to, ring that's not true. to ring your mum up and actually say how are you you know like what, what's going on in your life and and insist that actually it's about her you know and it's a lovely thing man it's a really nice thing you yeah know? i'm gonna try it myself later i'll foul oh, but yeah. i'm gonna amazing. give it a go no i think we should all give it a go yeah it's been it amazing go, it's been amazing to listen to you and have your outlook on it all and and just to know how positive you are and hopefully the people are listening that 
you know, uh, wh- whether you do want to sit down and play a computer game or whether you do want to sit down and meditate or read a book or, or anything, you know, if you can take yourself away from what's going on for just an hour a day, you know, I mean, my, for me, as I, I'm nearly a 30 year old man. But if I have a game of FIFA on my Xbox, I switch off from the world. You know, I, I, I stop thinking about everything terrible that's going on and I'm focusing on scoring goals. That's all I'm doing. But then that's how I will find my peace for, for a, a while. You know that, that there is ways of doing it. Um, yeah, it's just it's just trying to find the right thing for you, I guess. Yeah, giving yourself a break. Give yourself mm. a break. We can be very hard on ourselves, you know, and yeah. give yourself a break. Yeah. Yeah. Wicked. Yeah. Cheers, man. Nice Thank you very much, Johnny. Nice one, mate. <laughs> nice one. See you later, Thank man. you so much. That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah, cheers, Love Johnny. Lots of love, Love-y. mate. We'll add you into the group as well now. Do oh, that. Yeah, we'll you in. I'll, 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 yeah, I'll see how I go. <laughs> <laughs> I love you both. See you later, mate. mate. You love too, you too Thank love, you. Bye, 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 bye. Yeah. Yeah, um, again, like like we've touched bases in the intro and during during the chat. I mean, like we we understand it, mm. you know, as much as anybody else. Um, how tough it is, you know, during this time. But um, I guess all we can do is uh, just take on board a bit of Johnny's advice and just try and keep busy, try and keep active and. Um, appreciate the, the, you know, the times that we're getting to. I mean, I'm spending a lot more time with my family over, like, um, house party and, and Zoom yeah. and things like that. You know, we're doing a lot of quiz nights and stuff. And, you know, weirdly, I think it's brought a lot of people's relationships closer. Yeah, um, definitely, definitely. And I, I, you know, Johnny said something in the chat there about, um, like, ring someone and try and not make it about you. Yeah, yeah, that's so good. That so so good. You know, it's something that like I've I've never really thought of before. Like I will I will ring my mum or my you know my mates and moan or you know yeah. what I mean. What even say I I mean I will. It's just that normal kind of Mancunian thing, you know. Yeah, right. How's it going? But yeah. you don't mean it normally. It's just like right. I want to talk about my shit day. You know? Yeah. And and I think. That was one of the things from the chat that's, that stood out to me was... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was... Um, because you do it, don't you? I guess when I when I make a phone call, if I if I ring someone, you do do that, don't you? You, you just say, are you all right? Mm. You don't go, are you all right? Are you all right? Do you know what I mean? It's just like a, a thing that you just do, isn't it? You, and I, I tend to think that when I'm ringing someone, if I'm ringing them, I'm, I'm ringing them to moan about something that I've... Something that's going on for me. And you, and you don't really... You know, you, you don't sort of stop and think about how the other people are feeling sometimes, do you? But I guess that's what good friends are. Um, and I know that Johnny's one of them. That if ever I had any problems, like we took the touch base on the intro, if ever anything was going on, you know, I don't speak to Johnny every day, but, you know, we'll, we'll often send a lovely text and whatnot. Um, and I know that if it was three in the morning and if, if me and Charlotte had had an argument, say, I know for a fact that Johnny had answered the phone. Mm. Um, so I guess we're kind of blessed that we've got these sort of friends that, and it's the same with you. And I know you'd answer the phone and you know that I'd answer it. So I guess that's sort of, we're, we're, we're relying on friends at this time, aren't we? Yeah, that's it, man. Friends and family, like say, and just the little things, man. Just the little things like that, that, that you can, you can look on and go, oh, like, does that make you happy? Do you know what I mean? Mm. What, you know, I wanted to show um, about two days into like the, the the lockdown i broke my glasses so on the other podcast i've not had any glasses on because this is what i was wearing that right, taped them up oh my god look at them <laughs> so that's what i was because i can't see things far off and it was really stressing me out got to the point where i was getting headaches and that and then um i literally bought a pair of 19 pound glasses from uh spec savers rang them up Give them, ask them if they'd still got me prescription, which they did, which was amazing. Um, it, it, even from years ago, I think it was 2017, she said I'd been there. Um, but they were like, it's fine, we'll use that prescription. Ordered some new glasses, instantly felt better. Yeah. It, just £19. Like, Retail therapy, mate. 
Well, I mean, yeah, I guess it is, but then it was kind of like, you know, I don't know. I, I kind of, I think these symbolized to me at the beginning, right, the world's going to shit. Because <laughs> I, I fixed them and I, and, I, and I turned around to Emily and I was like, look, if this goes down, how, how it might go down, a.k.a. apocalypse shit, you were a survivor. <laughs> Do you know? Yeah, but if it went down apocalypse shit, yeah. you'd, be, you'd be fucked. Well, yeah, exactly, exactly. But you know, I think I think that's what I was thinking. That was my mentality at the beginning, and then and then slowly started realizing that it's not that bad. At the beginning, I thought, genuinely thought this was the end of the world, and then through chatting mm. to you, through doing this podcast with you, through mm. chatting like Johnny and that, like start to realize that actually it, it, it's not that. I mean, it's bad. No, of course, yeah. I mean, it's like sorry, go on, mate. Go on, go on. I, I was gonna say it is bad. You know, there's tragically. The loss of life is is incredibly awful, and we we should never forget about that. But I think the message here, like like we said, is is look for the the, the positives in in this situation. Yeah. yeah, and you know, there's not a day go by where you don't stop and you know, and you think about all the people that have lost their lives, not only to coronavirus, but to yeah. to everything, all the accidents and all you know, the cancer patients and and mental health. Um, sufferers and everything you know there's there's always bad things going on in the world but there is also a lot of good things going on in the world yeah and and if you choose to i know some people don't choose to but you know if some people can get swallowed up in 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 the bad in the bad news and again with the media which tend to do that a lot is this constantly sharing bad news you know people can get can drive themselves insane um and you know i guess trying to find the positives in what's going on i.e you know you're seeing these stories about 93 year old lady who's walking out of the hospital after yeah. beating coronavirus that's the kind of news that i want 106 that's, year old the other day 106 year old you know what i mean that's the that's the shit that i want and that's the shit that i'll share on facebook yeah that's the, you know because that that's that seeing that makes me feel better so i'm not going to share that there was you know 900 deaths yesterday or 800 deaths yesterday because it's uh, that's to me that's that's sharing the bad news and yeah you know, that, that's enough to put people on a downer I think yeah. you know what I mean oh, you, I mean you've got to be careful to you know to remember them of course yeah I get I get exactly what you're saying I think I do think sometimes the media is focusing heavily on that you know and I do I love it like I I, I think today this morning I saw someone share and um, you know there was like. Uh, how many worldwide, how many cases have recovered from it. And it just gives you that little bit of like, oh, yeah, mm-hmm. oh, yeah. It's I, about, I suppose it's about being selective and choosing what you want to hear and what you want to share, isn't it? It's like, yeah, you, you've got you've got to be really careful because, you know, for the people who, who, who might not necessarily want to know about how many people died yesterday because they're really struggling with it, I don't want to be the person that's sharing that sort of information. But what I want to do is I want to share that there's an 106 year old lady who's just beaten coronavirus because then if someone's struggling, that'll make hopefully make them feel better. Um, which again is I guess what what Johnny was saying in the podcast. It's we've just got to try and stay positive and you know and try and I mean I, I've I spend a lot I've got TikTok now I've downloaded TikTok because yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but there's no there's no terrible news on there. It's just people having fun. Yeah, that's... And, that, and that's my favourite thing at the minute. I spend a lot more time on TikTok than I do any social media at the minute because it's full of people trying their hardest to enjoy life, finding the light in in being at home, you know, doing little challenges like me with the golf balls in the back garden and the footballs and just having a bit of fun, which is uh, for me is the be- that's the best medicine at the minute is trying your hardest to to have fun at home, see see and appreciate what you've got at home as well. Do you know what I mean? Hundred percent, hundred percent, and and same with me, like. Um, I've, you know, like say, I said earlier, you know, the other day I had a bit of a downer where I just got stressed about, like, I've not been out of the house really. and, and, and Human you know. contact, man. Yeah, and, and it is hard that, like, I said this to my wife, you know, when, when she's at work, like, my, the, the only other person I speak to is, is a five-year-old. And that is amazing, but also stressful. But I decided to try and put that in a positive note and... I was saying to you the other day, me and Phoebe are going to do a little little side podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We recorded Just for the a... listeners, Andy's ditching me. He's going to poach all you <laughs> listeners. And he's replacing me with a five-year-old girl called Phoebe. So um, it was I... nice while it lasted. 
No, but it's cute. Like, like you say, like I'm, I'm showing the films that I loved as a kid, um, and then we're going to review them. So, like, we did one yesterday where we um, we watched Drop Dead Fred. Oh, what a film! Exactly. <laughs> and it's, a, it's a twelve, but I'm showing it to her because I watched it when I was five. Yeah, and it, you're not close to that one. It didn't do me any damage. No. Um, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, I guess it's that thing, in it? It's, it's find the positives. Try and, you know, do something if creative. If not, if you're not a creative person, that's fine. Just go for a walk. Play FIFA. Play FIFA, yeah. play Call of Duty. And you know what I found? Grand Theft Auto is the closest thing to real life that I've got at the minute. Online. No, I mean, on, How bad is Grimsby? On, in Grimsby. <laughs> now, online on Grand Theft Auto, what you've got to do is you have to buy your cars. And you yeah. have to pay to get them insured. You've got to buy an apartment. You can go to the casino. I was playing poker in the casino yesterday. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and it's like weird little things like that. I was on a roulette table. Weird little things like that are just like, you know, we, we was just sort of, me and Charlotte found fun in that. We was, yeah. there's a little thing in the casino where you can gamble on the horses, little virtual horse racing. And me and Charlotte are like, obviously GTA money, not real money. But like yeah. we was laughing our heads off at that. And I thought, just for 10 minutes, you know, we forgot about everything else that was going on in the world. So, you know, even if it is playing computer games or it is being in the back garden of a football or a golf ball, but, you know, it's just just try your hardest to appreciate the things that you've got. Do you know what I mean? And I guess that's what the message of this podcast was, really, which is why we decided it's a great time to to release it. Yeah. Well, that's us, guys. So, um, yeah, we hope you've enjoyed it, as always. And we'll be back next week. Uh, with another great guest. Yeah. Got a lot of great guests lined up. So, thank you. Yeah, cheers. Stay safe. Be seeing you.